I'm Emily Chang. All this week, Bloomberg Television and Radio are on the ground in Boston showcasing the innovation, diversity, and power of the regional tech economy. We are taking an in-depth look at local innovators from Fortune 500 companies to burgeoning robotics and biotech startups, venture capitalists, and government officials. We are joined now by Caroline Hyde at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Caroline, you have a big week ahead of you, a big week for us. Tell us what you have on tap. We certainly do. Emily, Boston is the state of Massachusetts as well, the hub for all things biotech, with world-renowned universities and research centers. But it is also expanding its reputation as a hub for all tech and innovation. One company betting on Boston is General Electric. The multinational just broke ground on its new world headquarters right here today. At the event, CEO Jeff Immelt spoke about the collaboration between the company and the city. Have a listen. One of the country's oldest companies in GE has moved its headquarters to one of the country's oldest cities in Boston for the purpose of creating the future. Whether it's in life sciences, renewable energy, uh, technology, aviation, material science, additive manufacturing, industrial internet, these are the things that we want to bring to this city. And these are the things we think we can do together. Now, it was last year when Boston won the bid for GE in a move that cost the city as much as $25 million in property tax relief on top of a $120 million incentive package from the state. Now, I sat down earlier with Boston Mayor Marty Walsh and spoke about the GE deal as well as asking him what about Boston's role as a tech innovation hub and how it stacks up to Silicon Valley. I think that w the day that we announced, officially announced GE's move to Boston, uh, th they gave us a check for fifty thousand dollars, fifty million, excuse me, fifty million dollars, um, uh, twenty-five million dollars for education, and twenty-five million dollars for job training, and also some healthcare stuff. Uh, so we're seeing the, the, those benefits of having GE here already. Um, the, the the deal that I guess we, people are having a little critical of the twenty-five million dollars uh, over as far as tax incentives, that that's to get the construction and the building going uh, and, and we're going to get about in the course of the next 30 years over 67 billion dollars in taxes uh, real estate taxes from from that deal wow and so therefore what does it mean do you think in terms of continuing the growth of the tech and biotech sectors here in Boston it's, it's so important I mean you know Boston has always done well in that space um, um, you know, and when you think about our city, people think about our city as a great medical city. People think about our city as a tech city. Um, there was a time in the 80s where Boston and Massachusetts really was the tech capital of the world, and then we lost that. We lost that to Silicon Valley, to, to, to San Francisco. And what's happening now, what I see happening now is almost like a, a rejuvenation of that and people coming back to our city. Uh, we're excited about what's happening. And, and what General Electric does, it adds, I think it adds a, a whole new light, level uh, of curiosity about Boston. Uh, we have about 150,000 students a year that, that go to school in our city. Many of them will stay here for the summers, many of them will stay when they graduate. Uh, so we grow every year. We have uh, 25 college universities within the Boston area, 75 in the greater Boston neighborhood. So there's a lot of innovation here through our colleges and, and a lot of synergies that we have to work off of. GE can help us with that. The ecosystem clearly thriving when it comes to academia, working with the private sector. Mm. You say you lost it to Silicon Valley. Can you win it back? Is it a case of winning? I think I think we are. We will win it back and can win it back, and, and we're, we're doing that now. I mean, Massachusetts went through a very difficult time in the 80s with with high taxes and, and a lot of uh, a lot of political decisions that, that really put us, set us back a bit. Uh, and I think what's happening here now is you have a climate, a political climate, where everyone is looking to continue to to, to move our economy forward, but yet also be innovative. I mean, th that word innovation is kind of on the top of everyone's tongue lately, whether it's in sports or it's in GE or it's in other types of business. And we're trying to be innovative here in the city of Boston, really to continue to attract these, these great companies here. And, you know, in the last three years in Boston, we've added 60,000 new jobs to the economy in Boston alone. So that's a, that's a good growth. We did that a little bit before GE even came. But I think with GE here, it's even going to help us grow even further. You talk about a political climate, one that helps with jobs and one that helps with innovation. Do you think that the administration is helping with their political climate to help with Boston as well? Washington? Yeah. Uh, no. I think that Washington, uh, when I say no, I, I'm, ho I, I'm hoping that they just get to the job of governing. Um, you know, I'd really like to see them be successful. 
Uh, I'd like to see this White House be successful. I think they need to, to focus on governing and, and start focusing on some of the other issues. Uh, I'm afraid of what it's going to do to our economy and, and the impacts. It hasn't had any yet on our economy, but I get concerned about all of the different pieces. I'm concerned about the Affordable Care Act. I'm concerned about the actions that, that Congress took last week. Uh, it's not a good bill. It is a repeal. And, and, and in a city like Boston or other, other urban cities around America, even small suburban cities around America, it's going to hurt hospitals. And, and that'll start to hurt the economy. So I wish they would, they would focus on what they talk about moving our country forward and not focus on repealing health care and, and defunding NIH funding and defunding housing programs. I think we need to do more than that, better than that. Boston has in particular thrived from NIH funding and from R&D spend. It really is like yeah. the number one city in terms of spending. Are you worried about the research and development area and how that could affect biotech? I was up until the, the, the Senate and the Congress passed a budget, a short-term budget. I think it goes through September. So in that budget, it seems like everything is kind of status quo. Actually, we have an increase, I believe, a little bit in NIH funding. Um, I think it's important that, 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 that we, we, we stay strong on that. I mean, when you look at our hospitals and our research facilities we have here in Boston, and, the, and, and Massachusetts, not just Boston, I mean, we're in this together, so Massachusetts as well, and Cambridge and other cities, um, you know, a, a lot of discoveries, a lot of, a lot of things are happening here in our city, and again, it helps us keep young people and talent here in the city of Boston. It helps our doctors and, and our, our hospital advance. Um, you know, I'm a cancer survivor. I was treated at the Dana Fava Can Cancer Institute. I was treat treated at the Children's Hospital. I was treated at the Brig Peter Ben Brigham, which is Brigham Women's now. Uh, so it's an we have important assets in our city. So as a cancer survivor, knowing that what I had as cancer 40 years ago, uh, today the cure rate is a lot higher than it was when I had it. It's Talking important. of you and your background, you are the son of immigrants, yes. I believe a lot of concern also about the travel ban and immigration policies that we've seen with this administration and what it means for talent, particularly technology talent in Silicon Valley and also with Boston. Do you feel that there's a concern for talent coming into your academic institutions and the companies? Yeah, and there was a concern beforehand. I mean, there was a concern because because uh, there wasn't enough visas being given out to have people staying here a long time. And now that there really is a concern in this very room that we're having this interview, uh, right after the president came down with his executive order on both the Muslim ban and the one before that, the immigrant ban, I had hospitals in this room. All the hospitals were Massachusetts. I had the college universities in this room. I had the tech companies in this room at three different meetings and the consul generals. And every single one of them had the same concern about, about the fear of, of the people not being able to come to the United States of America to get an education or to start up a business or to work for a company. And I think that, you know, Congress has been, you know, six or seven years now, maybe actually longer than that, they really should focus on immigration. There's a way to focus on this. I think that our system clearly isn't working. Uh, we have 11 million undocumented people in the United States of America. I think there has to be a reason. What do we do to, to make those 11 million people either put them on a pathway to citizenship or figure out what to do here? And then we have to look at our work visa program because we have these high-tech companies that, that they can get a J-1 visa, come for a year and work. Well, that's not, that's not good enough. It, we, we, we're going to have people get educated in the United States of America, yet we're not going to keep their brain power here. We're going to send them back home. That doesn't make any sense to me, and I don't think it makes any sense to a lot of people. And I hope that Congress and the Senate can get together and come up with some good comprehensive legislation. That was, of course, Marty Walsh, mayor of Boston. And joining me now to talk about the ecosystem here in the city is Corey Johnson, Bloomberg Radio anchor and TV editor at large. Both hats on at the moment, Corey. And fighting talk from Marty Walsh. Are you hearing that replicated in your radio show as well about where the ecosystem can be reclaiming that clown, crown from Silicon Valley? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the move of the technology industry from Massachusetts and from Boston to uh, Silicon Valley happened quite a long time ago. And there is, in fact, are there are a lot of companies that have been moving back here. Uh, but I think the move of GE, you know, I, I love that that, that happened to coincide with us being here today. Yeah. Because uh, everyone we talked to last year at this event and this year has been looking at GE's big move here and be doubling down at the same time that GE is really changing itself as a company as a sign of sort of Boston coming back in a really big way in technology, not just into biotech, but also in a, in a cloud businesses and in all kind of internet businesses. There's a real startup scene here and it's got a lot of the tools that we say Silicon Valley has in such a, a great degree, which is 
uh, great uh, academic institutions, uh, scientific institutions, the financial uh, community to back things. And I think that they look at the success Silicon Valley has had and want to get some of that back here. Well, here, it would be interesting to know how much the companies are lobbying well, the White House at the moment, because I've heard from the president of Harvard, we heard from Marty Walsh, the mayor of Boston, concerns about immigration policy and what that might do for tech talent. It's something that GE now coming in trying to compete for that sort of talent is going to be thinking about. Uh, you can certainly expect Boston and, and the people of Massachusetts to fight hard against any Republican administration, but this one in particular makes it easier, I think. Uh, uh, and, and the mayor here has really taken a strong stance. That said, uh, there's a real sense of business uh, a community here and, and the Democratic uh, uh, mayor working with the Republican governor. And this yeah. is just, isn't, I mean, these, these are guys who actually know each other and like each other quite well and work with to, well together in business issues. And I think that's a big issue for business people in the state of Massachusetts and in New England to see this, this again, Democratic mayor and Republican governor working together to help business. And, and, and you get that sense of real community here. And we're going to be speaking to that, of course, Republican governor a little bit later. Thank you very much indeed. Of course, Corey Johnson, Bloomberg editor at large, joining us there. He's all week here with the radio as well. And we also want to keep you up to date with the latest tech headlines throughout the hour of the of course, a story we're watching for you. Sinclair Broadcast Group buying Tribune Media in a deal valued at $3.9 billion. Now, it marks the first big acquisition since regulators eased a limit on TV station ownership in the U.S. Buying Tribune would give Sinclair access to big media markets like New York, Chicago, and indeed Miami. Plenty more Bloomberg technology from Boston coming up for you. We take a look next at IBM and see how it's using its Watson technology to come up with the next medical breakthrough. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio, of course. You can now listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. And as we've already discussed, now Boston is home to a number of big name tech companies. Now one of them, another one of them, of course, is IPM present here. Bloomberg Technology visited for IBM Security and Health Unit. They're headquartered just across the river in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, the company's cognitive technology, Watson, famed for winning the game show Jeopardy in 2011, but it's now applying its deep machine learning to everything from drug discovery to monitoring cyber attacks. 100 years ago, IBM was founded in Armonk, New York. The company has since grown into a technology powerhouse, making Cambridge, Massachusetts its base for innovation in the security and health fields. IBM Security got its start in Boston in 2011. Through the acquisition of Q1 Labs, we've since then grown to 8,000 people. We're operating in 133 countries around the world. And we haven't stopped acquiring companies. In fact, here in the Boston area, uh, we have now acquired more than a dozen companies focused on cybersecurity. IBM Security brings in $2 billion in annual revenue for the company and is using Watson, IBM's breakthrough analytical computer system, to monitor potential cyber attacks on its clients around the world. IBM's Vice President of Security, Caleb Barlow, explains how the company applies the technology. One of the real things about Watson that makes it incredibly advantageous both for IBM as well as for our customers is its ability to parse through massive amounts of information. And they offer customers a chance to face a simulated cyber attack, which IBM believes to be a crucial learning tool. Building on that success, IBM has also set up its healthcare unit in Cambridge. IBM's Chief Health Officer, Dr. K. U. Ree, explains why IBM Health laid its roots down in the city. There's such extraordinary talent here to recruit from. There's extraordinary partnerships that we've been able to evolve and we will continue to evolve. And there's such a hotbed of innovation and creativity here. IBM is pairing that talent with Watson in the hopes of coming up with the next medical breakthrough. One of the great parts of Watson is it is a system that understands natural language, 
It has been trained by the best doctors from Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, Memorial Sloan Kettering to understand medical language and medical literature. In the two years since IBM Health got started, it's partnered with Siemens, Johnson & Johnson and Apple, making progress in the fields of drug discovery and analyzing patient data. Last quarter, revenue from IBM's Cognitive Solutions business, which IBM Health falls under, rose to $5.3 billion. But its biggest breakthroughs are likely still to come. What I believe we have here is what I call a big data stethoscope, an ability to basically translate all this data and bring insights to an end user, to a doctor, to a policymaker, so that they can make better, smarter decisions out of that big data. Now, beyond Boston, here are some more headlines grabbing our attention for you. Now, another shot has been fired in the bidding war over 5G Spectrum license holder Straight Path. A mystery bidder, said to be Verizon, has made a bid for the company. The all stock offer is $184 per share, representing an enterprise value of about $3.1 billion, Straight Path said. Shares of Straight Path surged by a third after the news. Now, you'll remember that last month, AT&T agreed to buy Straight Path for $1.6 billion. The move gives AT&T just three days to match the offer. Now, Akamai is focusing on cybersecurity and machine learning services as its legacy internet content delivery business slows. We'll discuss Akamai's plans with CEO Tom Layton next. From Boston, this is Bloomberg. From Boston, this is a special edition of Bloomberg Technology. And we're now joined by Tom Layton, his CEO of Akamai, which is one of the largest tech employers in Massachusetts. The company which helps speed delivery of internet content is located in nearby Cambridge, where it is expanding and hiring graduates from local schools. And therefore, Tom, how crucial is the ecosystem of academia and partnered with business here for your particular stuff? I think the ecosystem in this area is fabulous and it, it really does start with the university system. You have several of the world's best universities here, dozens of universities training technical talent, great place for hiring and a great work ethic. You know, uh, people stay with companies for longer here than you often see in the valley. Yeah. Interestingly though, a lot of startups have been spawned by former Akamai employees. I think something I read in 39 startups, no less, have been born of founders from your company. Is the talent pool big enough here? Are you worried in any way about curbs to immigration, curbs to getting foreign talent into the US as well as homegrown? We have a great talent pool here, starting with the universities. We do worry about curbs on integration. It, it is important to attract the very best talent from around the world. Uh, and that said, at Akamai, you know, we're working to increase the talent pool. We have a, a program called the Akamai Technical Academy where we train primarily women and minorities who don't have a technical background, train them so they can take a technical job at Akamai and a really exciting program for us. That's interesting, because that's something, of course, that Silicon Valley is coming under increasing pressure for, the lack of diversity. How is diversity at your company and indeed in the Boston and Massachusetts area? I, I think diversity is a challenge in all of tech. And that's why you know, we are making efforts to improve it by increasing the talent pool through training, uh, through grants to STEM-related education. We sponsor Girls Who Code. You know, every way we can to try to help diversity in tech. Is the current White House administration helping with diversity at all, do you think, yet? Oh, well, you know, I, I'm not directly familiar there, but I think that's something that we got to take on ourselves, okay. uh, you know, to improve the situation, well, certainly in Massachusetts, where there's a lot of interest in doing that. I'm interested in your viewpoint of how the current White House is doing for your ecosystem, your economic economy here in Boston and Massachusetts. Would you? How would you currently feel? Is it net positive, net negative from the first 100 days or so? I know it's short. Well, I think it remains to be seen. Uh, you, you know, I think the uh, changes in taxes could be beneficial. We would like to see, uh, you know, not have curbs on immigration and visas and travel is important to us. 
Uh, we'll have to look and see what happens, you know, with things like net neutrality. Talk to me about net neutrality, because if this is, of course, you serve ISPs, internet service providers, and this is something they're affected by, but how much are you affected by it? Are you pleased by Ajit Pai's recent moves or not? I think, you know, we weren't regulated before, so it doesn't really directly affect us. I think it probably does help the carriers who are our partners. I think most of the content companies, they're our customers, and so they're not impacted, will still deliver their traffic within the major carriers. You know, there's probably a couple content companies that are less happy about what's happening, but I think on balance, it's going to be fine. And Tom, talk to us on balance about your business, because there was a significant fall in terms of share price reaction to your numbers. Did that ferociousness surprise you, and, and how are you trying to ease investor concern for your longer term growth? Yeah, I think Akamai is very healthy. We are growing at a good clip, and we have two major lines of business. Uh, one is around performance and security, which is about 60%, and that has 50% EBITDA margins, grew at 18%. It's doing great. Security products on fire, growing at nearly 40%. And we have a media business, which delivers a lot of video, and that business is doing well, but it's not growing as fast as it did. And so it grew about 1% year over year. Uh, and so the you know, street wanted to see more growth there, and they worry a lot about quarter to quarter changes in traffic. Media traffic spikes up and goes through valleys. We're in a little bit of a valley now, but I think everybody believes that OTT and video is coming. And we're in a great position to benefit because we deliver a lot of that traffic. Tom Noten, I'm very pleased that you came to us here in Boston, of course. Great to be so close to your home, the home of Akamai. And that, of course, was the CEO, Tom Noten, speaking with us. Now, coming up, the Boston Pops is kicking off its 117th season this week. We'll talk to the man that's been leading the orchestra about the changes this year and how they are using new technology to bring music to the masses. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The White House confirms former President Obama warned then incoming President Trump about hiring Michael Flynn as his national security advisor. It's true that the president made it, President Obama made it known that he wasn't exactly a fan of General Flynn's, uh, which is frankly shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that given that General Flynn had worked for President Obama was an outspoken critic of President Obama's shortcomings, specifically as it related to his lack of strategy confronting ISIS and other threats around uh, that, that were facing America. Flynn was asked to resign after misleading Vice President Pence about his contacts with Russia. In Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel says she is very happy that Emmanuel Macron won the presidential election in France. Speaking in Berlin today, Merkel said Macron bears the hopes of many Europeans and pledged to continue Germany's close cooperation with France. Syria's foreign minister is dismissing the idea of foreign forces patrolling four safe zones that are to be established under a deal struck by Russia, Iran and Turkey. The official told reporters in Damascus Syria would only settle for Russian military police who are already on the ground. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Monday here in Washington, 7.30 Tuesday morning in Canberra, Australia. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen. He has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Elisa. We're seeing some good strength on the Nikkei futures traded out of Chicago at the moment, up by more than 1%. ASX futures are showing uh, a little strength as well. We're waiting really here on the uh, release of a third quarter trading update from Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Uh, that is the biggest of the big four banks here. But I am in Canberra for the big story of the day, which is the release of the Australian budget. Uh, we're expecting the deficit to come in a little lower for the year, at 27 billion Australian dollars. That's about 20 billion US. And for the budget, to return to surplus by the end of the decade, uh, though that may be based on some reasonably optimistic uh, growth assumptions. It is also a big day in South Korea. It is polling day there, an election to replace the former president, Pak Geun-hye. Candidates cover the political spectrum, and one of the key themes is the dismantling of the so-called Chaebols, the big family-run conglomerates that have so much influence in South Korea. Also watching earnings from OCBC, Mitsubishi Motors and Subaru. I'm Paul Allen in Canberra. More 
more from Bloomberg Technology next. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde, and we are live from Boston all this week, showcasing the innovation, the diversity, and the power of this city's tech economy. Now, the Boston Pops opens its 117th season this week at Boston's Symphony Hall. And the theme, well, it's the music of former conductor and maestro of the silver screen, John Williams. The Pops recently recorded an album of his music in a high-tech, state-of-the-art studio many concert-goers don't even know exists. Start with a little of this. Add some of this. And after two hours of Keith Lockhart leading the Boston Pops, you will have a recording of the selected works of maestro John Williams or the man he Pops and Boston Pops, Symphony Pops, Orchestra Pops, Managing Pops, Director Pops, Mark John Volpe Williams, says, is, is the soundtrack of our time. John can write a melody better than anybody else. I mean, you, you, you say Star Wars, it comes into your head. You say E.T., you, 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 know, you, you hear it in your head. The recording is overseen and supervised by Nick Squire, one of the few full-time sound engineers employed by any U.S. orchestra. It's visually appealing, uh, it sounds great, and it really allows us to uh, record and listen to the orchestra and, and make sure that we're, we're making the right decisions when we, when we you know, move mics or, or mixing in the space. The recording studio recently underwent a quarter million dollar upgrade and is arguably the most advanced in the country. The split wood paneling makes for a better sound, as do the Bowers and Wilkins speakers. The improvements were carried out by the Walter Stork Design Group, who also counts Jay-Z and Alicia Keys as clients. We are maybe, uh, along with one or two of the European orchestras, the most recorded orchestra in the world. The profit from such recordings once represented as much as 15% of the BSO's income. Almost 40 years later, in 2015, of the $46 million taken in, media represented just over 1%. Used to be you would tour it to, to actually sell recordings. And now if you record, you're trying to drive people to concerts. It's a branding play, it's a promotion play. That visibility comes in other ways too like the deal the BSO made in 2015 with Google Play Music to make some of its performances available for streaming or download. After the concert, conductor Lockhart will come down for a listen to see how things went. But for now, he is in full performance mode so that every note captured for posterity is just right. That was Bloomberg's Tom Maroney reporting there. And joining us now, Keith Lockhart, conductor of the Boston Pops. And a quick correction, it's the 132nd season. But who's We're about counting? Right? Who's counting? You are, because you're a man who's been here for more than two decades as the conductor. You're a man who's done, what is it, 1,800 now that you've conducted? Concerts? Somewhere, I have lost count of that. <laughs> Talk to us about, as a technology show, how technology has changed in your role and the music you helped bring to life over the past two decades. Oh, it, it's hard to describe in the 23 years I've been there how much technology has changed around us. And that, of course, has no choice but to influence what we do at the symphony. Uh, when I came to Boston as the conductor of the Pops in 1995, I didn't have a cell phone and I didn't have an email address. And now the ubiquity of the web, uh, the way that we get our, our entertainment, our culture, our information has changed so profoundly. And, you know, orchestras are a very old, very analog sort of uh, thing. And it's really been our goal in these last couple of decades to catch up with the way the rest of the world receives information. And of course, you've been making joint ventures, partnering with the likes of Google Play, as we saw in that particular piece. What about other areas and avenues that you would like to see to help boost the consumption of the music that you make? Well, I think that um, a lot of it has to do with the dissemination of our product, uh, making our stage larger, if you will. Certainly, our you know upcoming relationship with Bloomberg 
as a, a sole platform, but being seen really worldwide, ubiquitous, uh, is, is an amazing change for us and something that I hope we do more of in the future because what we have to do is get out of the concert hall as much as we can to bring people into the concert hall. And you do that. You get out of the concert hall. I mean, here you have the Boston Pops, which is, of course, a spectacle in front of half a million people, but you are also a man who travels, conducts in Australia, in Japan, in the UK, in Germany. How does Boston compare when you're looking internationally? Well, I am so fortunate as a musician and an artist to make Boston my home. This is a place that is both very, very old and very committed to its, uh, its traditions and very new and very changing all the time. It's a dynamic place. There's a huge hunger for the arts, for learning, for culture here. It makes it a great place to make music. And uh, no matter how many places I enjoy conducting, and I do have the great opportunity to go all over the world, I'm always glad to come back to Boston. July the 3rd and the 4th is when Boston Pops will be, of course, performing to the masses here in the city. What bit will get your the hairs on the back of your neck standing on end? <laughs> well, when we get to the end of the concert and we launch into Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, a piece that has become part and parcel with our celebrations, though it has nothing to do with the American War of Independence. Uh, the, and I get to that and I know that we've done a good job and I know that we're almost done. That's when I allow the Harris to stand up on the back of my neck. Keith Lockhart, long may that keep on going. Thank you very much indeed for Thank joining us today. Of course, Keith Lockhart, Boston Pops conductor. And of course, Bloomberg is indeed a sponsor of the Boston Pops. Now to a stock that we're watching for you. Apple's record run continued on Monday, pushing the company's market cap past, get this, $800 billion for the first time ever. That makes it the most valuable public company ever. Now, biotech executives and the head of the National Institutes of Health met with Vice President Mike Pence on Monday. Their goal? To defend government-sponsored research after the president's budget proposal sought deep cuts. President Donald Trump's administration proposed cutting a whopping $1.23 billion from the NIH's budget this fiscal year and $5.8 billion next year. The meeting, which was also attended by first daughter Ivanka Trump, examined the relationship between government, universities, philanthropy and industry with aims of maintaining America's place in biomedical discovery. Now coming up, how Bentley University plans to redefine the future of business education in the Boston area. Our exclusive interview with the university's president, Gloria Larson, next. From Boston, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Now, I want to welcome in our next guest, Gloria Larson, president of Bentley University, a woman who, I mean, the wealth of experience you have across education, government, regulation, business, there's so much I could throw your direction, but <laughs> primarily, when it comes to education and your role as president of Bentley University, how are you feeding the tech ecosystem and biotech ecosystem here and indeed US and globally? You know, that's one of my favorite questions because I've been at Bentley for 10 years now and I have to say one thing I've learned, particularly coming out of a US and global recession, is that graduates today need a deep dive into particular subject matter, actual professional skills and knowledge, and at the same time they still need broad liberal arts. They need critical thinking, communication skills. They need to be both left and right brain thinkers. So for example, at Bentley, we have a health industry major. We have a sustainability science major. So the kids who are passionate about the biosciences or about climate change can come to Bentley and they can study something they're passionate about. But I swear if they get a degree in finance too, the wind farm, the biotech startup, they will be the kids who are hired because they can read a balance sheet. You actually need both. Talking of the kids, as you call them, coming in, where are they coming from? How much of it is international and how much is that perhaps under pressure under recent moves by the current White House administration? You know, I have to tell you, we were a little bit surprised because you just don't know until the numbers come in. So the deadline nationally was May 1st for kids who will be freshmen in college next year to get their down payment in. And we have actually gone up this next year in our international quotient. So it's up now to a little 
over 15% undergraduate. That's great. We think to have international kids in the classroom with domestic U.S. kids from across the country is the right way to go. It's actually the marketplace they're going to be going into. So we were a little surprised given some of the hesitancy that we've heard about, given some of the new administration statements and actions. Um, but I think the real impact we're seeing and we will all see, schools will all see, is in the graduate school area. I think if you have to decide to leave your job for a year, you're going to be a little bit more antsy as opposed to a kid who's 18 um, and wants to come from Madrid to school in the U.S. Interesting. Let's shift the conversation on to the, uh, onto the private sector and the working world yes. now because I'm sure our audience can hear the hubbub around us. We are surrounded by business leaders. It I is feel the like Boston, I know them all. It's the Boston Chamber of Commerce all gathered here. Talk to us about how the Bentley University is working with private sector to ensure you're getting the right sort of skill set. You know, partnerships between higher ed and companies didn't really used to exist, not in any great strong numbers. But I think, again, since the recession, Schools have come out from under a bubble. They used to operate sort of in their own world. Today, to have companies come in and help you think about your curriculum, how to shape it for the future, companies in the classroom with case studies, even for undergraduates, companies who want the best talent, work with our career services team to make sure that they're going to get a foot in the door with just the right kids. And I think having companies talk to you about the skills they actually need, as opposed to the things we might think up on our own is a really good idea. It's one of those things that you kind of wish 20 years ago we'd known about this. Gloria, I, I introduced you by saying the wealth of, of experience you had, not only when you were, of course, a lawyer, but also working in education. But you did interestingly work with the FTC. You were working as, as a regulator. Go back to that time now. And if yes. you were confronted by the Google and Facebook of today, how would you be looking at them? Do you think the regulatory environment is the right one? You know, I think the... <laughs> Here's my own agenda, if you will, my own philosophy about regulation. Regulation works best when the pendulum does not swing too far either direction. We don't need laissez-faire. You need fair rules of the road in the marketplace. At the same time, you don't need command and control heavy-handed regulation. And I think we've seen the pendulum for over the last 30 years go in both directions. I actually think a more centrist position where you invite companies to the table, particularly companies that have haven't traditionally been regulated like the tech industry. You're thinking about what might work so that consumers feel safer about privacy, for example, confidentiality, uh, or cyber issues. Getting company CEOs at the table to talk through where things should be going, I think works every time. So I'm hopeful that in the new administration um, that we don't see a return to Chicago school laissez-faire. I hope we're seeing some sort of something that works in the middle for everyone. All right, Larson, now you'll be going to the business community, getting them round a canopy or two, even if it's not around the table. Thank <laughs> you so good. much. <laughs> Wonderful to have you with us. Of Thank course, you. the Bentley University president joining us there. Now, next, we will, of course, be speaking to none other than the Massachusetts governor, Charlie Baker, and get his take on last week's healthcare vote and the future of innovation in the state. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology. Now, we are live from Boston all this week, and I want to welcome our special next guest, Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker. Wonderful to have you here at this table, surrounded by the hub of the Boston Chamber of Commerce. Charlie, number one state in terms of digital economic growth, number one state in terms of R&D per capita. You have a lot of feats in front of you. How do you maintain that sort of focus and growth? Well, I think the most important thing we need to do is to continue to build on what's been successful. If you're talking about life sciences or you're talking about robotics or cybersecurity or so many other areas that are associated with industrial internet, we have a lot of the raw material and the intellectual capital that people are looking for. And that means continuing to invest on a public-private basis with a lot of the people who are creating jobs in this space, but also with a lot of the research institutions. 
We've put almost 100, we've put over $100 million of state money alongside federal funds, employer funds, and college and university funds in a whole series of advanced technology investments, which we think are going to continue to roll this whole train forward. This is clearly what you can do um, from a state level. When you're looking from a White House and, and country level, how much do you think the support is there for you at the moment to continue that sort of investment? Well, I think one of the best examples of that is the recent discussion about what the uh, National Institute of Health should be funded at. Big discussion about whether or not it should be cut came out of the budget process with a $2 billion increase. We have the largest share on a G, uh, per capita uh, and on a percent of GDP ba basis of NIH funding in the country, and we should, because a lot of the most important inquiry that's done and discovery that's done in all of those fields is done right up the street from here. But it's only a temporary budget up until September. Uh, is it a stay of execution? Look, one of the things that I felt pretty good about when that whole conversation started was the fact that this is one thing Republicans and Democrats seem to agree on in Washington, which is that investments in research, investments in discovery and inquiry translate into solutions that become products and become cures and therapies. And, uh, and I, I feel pretty good about that. We'll continue to work with our colleagues in other states and our delegation. But there are a lot of people in D.C. who get why these investments pay off. You made a very demonstrative speech where, uh, at the beginning of the year, really talking about how political dialogue perhaps isn't where it should be. Do you think political dialogue after the first 100 days is improving? In Washington? In Washington and, and indeed from a state level as well. Well, I mean, I, my mother, God rest her soul, was a good Democrat. My father's a Republican. They canceled each other out for 60 years. And I grew up just believing that there's more than one point of view. And in public life especially, if you can't find ways to work with people you don't always agree with, you'll never get anywhere. And I take tremendous pride in the fact that GE, which just broke ground on their new corporate headquarters here today, said that one of the things they appreciated was the fact that the Democrat mayor of Boston and the Republican governor seemed to get along, and that that was something they didn't see in a lot of other places. Talk to us about that relationship that you're building with private companies. You wooed over GE. There were some, some tax benefits in it for General Electric. But how much are you going out and starting these sort of joint ventures? You talked about public-private partnerships. How much is that at the, at the core of what you're trying to achieve in this Well, state? I mean, obviously, a big part of what we try to do is make sure that the investments we make generate a return. Whether we're investing in transportation or higher education, or some of these joint initiatives around advanced manufacturing of photonics and the next generation of fibers and materials, which is being led by MIT. I mean, we're a player in those investments, but there are other people who are putting a lot more money into them than we are, including the federal government. I mean, I spoke with, of course, the, the man you get along so well with that lured in General Electric, you, the, the mayor of Boston, and Marty was saying, look, I, I do think that we can reclaim our crown versus Silicon Valley. Do you think you can? Do you think it's a race? Um, I don't know if I would call it a race. I prefer to think of it as a competition. Um, and I think we start with many of the most important ingredients. And the biggest one we start with is this incredible ecosystem of colleges and universities. We have great schools here, too. Lots of STEM graduates, number one in AP scores in the country, advanced placement scores. Also, the only state that's ever finished first on the National Education Assessment Exam for high schoolers uh, in English and math, and we've done it six years in a row. I do believe that one of the things that really separates us from many others is the quality of our school systems and the quality of our education infrastructure generally. Quick last question. Number one priority, therefore, for the rest of 2017 from you at a state level. Well, the thing I always hear about is for young people and young families, we need more housing. We're making a big investment in what I would call workforce housing and housing people who work and afford. Uh, we're also going to continue to make big investments in our transportation system. One of the great things, we have one of the great problems, which is everybody works around here. So there's a lot of traffic in the morning and a lot of traffic in the afternoon. We need to do a better job of making sure that we can deliver transportation solutions. And we are going to continue to invest in the things that have made us successful, hopefully alongside a lot of those colleagues we have in the public and uh, not-for-profit and private sectors that have been so good at this so far. Charlie Baker, thank you so much for giving so much of your time. And we'll see how that focus on inequality continues. I look forward to having the same conversation next year. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. The governor, of course, of Massachusetts, Emily. Fascinating conversations throughout. Let's get back to you in San Francisco.
Thank you, Caroline. And tell us quickly what you've got on tap this week. We're going to be live all week there. I know, we're going to have so many great conversations. We've had a deep dive into Dell EMC, for example. We're going to be going inside their labs. That's it from Bloomberg Technology.